Family Theater presents Susan Hayward and Sterling Holloway. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents the story of Danny Dollar Bill, starring Sterling Holloway. To introduce the drama, here is your hostess, Susan Hayward. Thank you, Tony Lafano. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Family theater's only purpose is to bring to everybody's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we're to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. Tonight, Family Theater takes great pleasure in presenting the story of Danny Dollar Bill, starring Sterling Holloway as the narrator. This is the story of a dollar bill named Danny. Danny wasn't exactly born. He was printed, which amounts to the same thing in the life of a dollar bill. Along with countless other dollar bills, Danny was put through huge machines which stamped him all over with numbers and official seals and all that goes to make the well-dressed dollar bill. Finally, he was put through a big machine that stamped a lovely picture of George Washington on one side of him. Danny didn't mind all this printing rigmarole, and in fact, it was kind of fun. When he went through the machine that stamped the picture on him, it tickled, and Danny wriggled. <laughs> well, finally, Danny went sliding out a chute and landed on a long, flat table. Cautiously, Danny lifted one of his crisp edges and glanced about. On an adjoining table, he saw a whole pile of new $5 bills. And being of a very friendly disposition, Danny yelled out to one of the fives. Hi! But the five lifted Lincoln's nose and went, <laughs> Well, Danny was a little hurt by this, but then one of the other dollar bills spoke up. Don't feel bad, Danny. The fives never speak to us dollar bills. They only speak to the tens. Oh, and do the tens talk to them? No, the tens speak only to the twenties. Well, gosh, then who do the twenties speak to? Now, there you got a point. I doubt if they talk to the Treasury Secretary himself. Gee, there's quite a system around here, isn't there? Yeah, but you'll catch on when you've been around a few days. Hey, I wonder how much a dollar will buy. Oh, I don't care so much about what I buy. I just want to make people happy. Well, Danny didn't have long to wait. For the next day, he was bound up in a neat little package with 99 other dollar bills and taken for a ride in an armored truck bound for a nearby bank. Danny was about to go into circulation. His life was about to begin. Danny watched the people as they approached the teller's window, and he wondered who he would be given to. And just then, the teller picked him from the dollar compartment and handed him to a man in uniform. The man carried Danny and some other money from the bank and headed straight for a huge black limousine. He got in and then gave all the money to a very distinguished-looking gentleman sitting in the rear seat. And then they all drove away. Danny's imagination began to race. What would the man buy with him? Maybe some shares in a large corporation or a part of a bridge or a building or an island even. And suddenly the car stopped and Danny was handed back to the chauffeur who took him into a store and gave him to a girl behind a counter. The girl gave Danny an admiring look. Oh, brand new, huh? Just make it. <laughs> well, Danny thought this was very amusing and he gave her a loud pop of approval when she snapped him between her hands. Danny craned his edges to look back and see what the chauffeur had bought with him. But when he saw what it was, he wished he hadn't looked. The man was walking away with two cigars. He had spent Danny's whole value for just two cigars. And no change yet. <laughs> Shucks. 
might just as well be a little old quarter or something if that's all I'm going to buy in this world. He said to himself. I thought at least I'd be able to Hey, buy... hey, bud. Sis, hey. Who, who's that? Hey, I'm sitting right underneath you here. Underneath? Oh, gee, excuse me. I must be crowding nah, you. Nah, sit still, chum. It's kind of cozy in all these cash registers, but we get used to it. Uh, are you a dollar bill, too? It's so dark in here, I can't quite make you out. Yeah, we're all dollars in this here space. Uh, the name's Horace. Horace? Yeah, crummy name for a buck, ain't it? Oh, no, I, I didn't mean to... Oh, that's all right, kid. You knew? Yes. How do you like it? Well, it is a little disappointing so far. All I've done is buy two cigars. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get around. I just came in from the racetrack myself. Oh? Yeah. Now, there's the life, kid. Plenty of excitement. You're always on the move. Well, just what do we buy at the races? Well, we don't buy nothing, really. People use us to bet on the nags. Ah, oh, you ought to see them. I didn't go nuts. Uh, does this betting make them happy? Happy? Yeah, I guess. When they win, which ain't often. The guys that bet me usually lose their shirts. I must be a jinx or something. Oh, I don't think I care too much about going to the racetrack, then. You see, Horace, I want to make people happy when I buy things for them. Oh, you want to make people happy, huh? Well, it's a noble ambition, kid. I wish you luck. But the chumps that put me in their wallets never seemed uh, much better off for having owned me. But as I say, I wish you good luck. For the next several days, Danny was kept quite busy. Well, as busy as a dollar bill could be. And then one day, Danny found himself in a woman's purse. Well, it was enough to give even a dollar bill a headache. Well, Danny was carried about in this purse for some time until one day the purse was opened and Danny found himself in the midst of a great celebration. He looked about and saw signs proclaiming what appeared to be a holiday in his honor, for everywhere there hung huge streamers reading Dollar Day. Oh, Danny's new so owner yes, carried him into a large department store where absolute bedlam reigned. Danny hadn't seen such confusion since one day in the bank when the Indian head pennies got after the buffalo nickels. And then he heard the woman saying to her companion, Mabel, I've got an extra dollar here. I think I'll buy George a tie. He doesn't need any more than his nose, but I can't resist the sale. And this was the last straw for little Danny Dollar Bill. Well, that does it. I'm not going to be spent for another silly purchase. Just wait till she reaches in here to get me. I'll take this one, dearie. Here's the money. Oh, I dropped it. Oh, dropped it. Mabel, help me find the dollar, William. I dropped it right here somewhere. Well, it just seemed to wiggle right out of my hand. Oh, dear, I hope I didn't lose it. <laughs> You'll not find me if I can help it, lady. No, sir. Not if you're going to spend me for something you don't need. Well, Danny floated to the floor and was carried beneath the feet of the shoppers to the sidewalk outside, where a whirlwind of ale lifted him high above the sidewalks. It was a gusty day, and Danny was blown for blocks before he finally came back to earth again. And when he did, he found himself in a park. Danny looked around. Hmm, now let's see. This time, I'll do the choosing as to who spends me. Hey, there's a fellow who looks like he could use me. Maybe he'd like a dollar to spend on a meal or something like that. I'll just lift one of my edges to the wind and see if I can't drift over his way. Well, David, I see you're still with us. I was hoping maybe you'd found something since I saw you yesterday. Hello, Clancy. No, no, nothing yet. Look, boy, I don't usually do this, but uh, have you had anything to eat today? I could advance you a little, you know. No, thanks, Clancy. Look, I'm solvent. This dollar bill just blew up to me like a long-lost friend. Ha! What can you buy for a dollar these days? Well, I was thinking of investing in a haircut. I found an ad in the paper here that I might qualify for. Oh? Yeah, here it is here, uh... Wanted, piano tuner, young, ambitious, must be neat, and good musical ear. And you'll think you'll qualify for that, eh? I've been exposed to music all my life, Clancy. David, my boy, who are you, anyway? <laughs> you ever hear of David Warwick? David Warwick? That concert fella played in Carnegie Hall and all them places? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, whatever happened to him? He just sort of dropped out of sight, didn't he? Clancy, David Warwick is now a bum who sits around on park benches and reads the want ads. But but I don't get it. My boy, with your talent, you ought to be on top of the world like you used to be. What are you doing here? Very simple, Clancy. I hate music. You hate it? But, but 
Why did you ever take it up in the first place? I didn't take it up, my friend. I wanted to paint, but I had no choice. Mother wanted me to be a concert pianist, so for as long as I can remember, it was always practice, practice, practice. All the other kids would be out playing ball or something, but me, David Warwick, oh, no, no, I was playing the piano. Practice, practice. Well, the years went by. It was one concert after another. I was a success. But I still wanted to make painting my life. Mother was just as determined that I should not let it interfere with my music. Well, it finally got so bad that I had to sneak out of the apartment to attend art classes. Ah, those domineering mothers. I rode along with it for quite a while. And then I met Eve. <laughs> she was an art instructor in the school I attended. And, well, fancy, it was one of those things. I fell for her all the way. She for me. Or so I thought. What happened, lad? Good question, Clancy. I wish I knew what happened. She just plain vanished. I've been looking for her ever since. Months now. Well, it's hard for people to just disappear. Didn't she give any reason? That's well, all very strange, Clancy. Things seem to be going so well, we'd plan to be married. For obvious reasons, I'd avoided introducing her to Mother. But one evening, I took Eve with me to the concert I was playing. Mother, you and Eve get acquainted while I make pretty music for the customers. Oh, hurry, David. The maestro is already furious with you. Okay, I'll see you later. Let's go into David's dressing room for a moment, Eve. All right, Mrs. Warwick. Eve, I'll get right to the point. I frankly don't approve of your marrying David. You don't... You don't? Why? I don't approve for this reason. I know just as well as I'm standing here that once David marries you and moves out of my home, he'll forsake his music for this painting whim of his. After all, it's his life. I know what's best for him. Well, Mrs. Warwick, I, I don't quite know what to say. Then let me say it for you. Now, I've taken the trouble to look into your life, Eve. You've had your present position with the art school for five years. You're considered one of their best instructors. You also support your invalid mother and your two younger brothers, correct? Yes. Quite. All very commendable. Now, um, I have a proposition for you. As you perhaps know, I wield considerable influence in certain circles of this city. Therefore, I am in a position to offer you the managership of the uh, Chatsworth Galleries. The Chatsworth Galleries? A position a good many people would give anything to have. But in return... You are to give up the idea of marrying David. Oh. To be even more explicit, never see him again. Just vanish. But, Mrs. Warwick, you don't seem to understand. We love each other. Why, I, I wouldn't even consider such a thing. No job means that much to me. It might be wise to consider it, my dear. As I said, I do have considerable influence. You could report for work tomorrow morning and find someone else in your place. <sighs> and also find yourself unable to get another teaching position anywhere in this city. But this is unbelievable. Well, think it over carefully, my dear. I'll leave you now and look in again at the end of David's concert. Oh, uh, may I suggest? It would be better if we found you gone when we return. As I said, my dear, I am used to having my own way. <laughs> Remember your audience, go back and take your bow. Where's Eve? Where'd she go? Oh, David, the audience is clamoring for Hang you. the audience. Now, where's Eve? She's... she's gone, David. Gone? Where? Well, we had a little chat, and, and she decided... Chat? That... What did you tell her? You sent her away. David, the audience I'm is... afraid something like this was going to happen. Look, Mother, if this is true, I'll never touch a piano again as long as I live. Now, please step aside. I'm going out and find Eve. But, David, the audience... David! David! Well, that's the whole sad story, Clancy. I went out that night to find Eve, and I'm still looking. Never a trace of her, eh? No, no, not one. Mother is very thorough. There were no tracks. Yeah, well, where's that barber shop? It's right down there, past the gallery a bit. The gallery? Art gallery? Oh, yeah, the Chatsworth galleries. I've heard of them. Exhibition today, admission $1. Proceeds to Orphan's Milk Fund. <laughs> you know, Clancy... I got a notion to go in. Gosh, it seems years since I wandered through one of these places. Well, it's your dollar. Hmm. No, no, I guess I better not. Still... Tell me, 
If you hate music so, and vow never to touch a piano again, why were you going to apply for that piano tuner's job? Clancy, there's only one thing in this world I know anything about, and that's music. And like it or not, a man can get just so hungry. Well, here goes. Yes, sir. Give me a dollar's worth of haircutting, friend. Danny sat in the cash drawer of the barber shop, a very disappointed dollar bill. Though his shabby friend had spent him for something he needed, Danny knew the man wasn't going to be any happier for it. And most of all, he wanted to make people happy. Danny sighed. Oh, shucks. Things just never seem to work out the way I'd like them to. Gosh, I wish I were a five-dollar bill. I'll bet if I could buy more, people would like me better. Don't you believe it, chum? Hmm? People treat us fives just the same. Well, the voice startled Danny. It came from the next compartment in the cash drawer. Danny raised one of his edges to see who had spoken. And when he saw, what a shock. It was a five who had spoken to him. A very dirty, wrinkled five. I, I'm only a one, you know. Oh, yes, I know. But I got over that silly business of not speaking to the small change a long time ago. Gee, I'm glad. I, I mean... I know. I used to be that way, but I finally woke up. After all, we all come from the same place. And we'll all end up in the same spot in the end. So why go through life snubbing the little guys, I said? Oh, what do you mean we'll all end up in the same place in the end? What does happen to old money anyway? You mean you don't know? No. Well, that ain't good, but... But take my advice and don't worry about it. Enjoy yourself and do what good you can while you're around. Oh, well, here goes somebody. Good luck, friend. The barber put in another $5 bill and counted out Danny and three other dollar bills for change. As Danny was being lifted out of the drawer, he waved to the new five going in. Hiya! Really? <laughs> <laughs> there it was. Another snub. But this time... Danny had to laugh. <laughs> she'll learn, she'll learn. A couple of trips to the butcher shop and the filling station and she'll be speaking to everyone. <laughs> Danny began his usual round of buying again, always trying but never seeming to accomplish too much. Finally, several purchases later, he found himself on a bus. All right, step in, please. Step in. Step back in a bus, please. Let's go. A five? Oh, come on, mister. Have a heart. I know, I know. It's the smallest you got. Okay, a uh, forty, fifty, a dollar, two, three, four. Now, one dollar makes five. Step in, please. Ken. Let me have a few dollars before we get there, will you? What for? Well, I know you. Once you get near those gambling tables, you'll not stop until we're flat broke. Oh, all right, here. Yeah. Two bucks ought to get us home in style. Good. Now you just forget that I've got it. Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Place your bets, please. <laughs> Let's go after this play. I'm tired. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Number 14 on the red win. 14. Blast a lot. 14 red. Where's the rest of the money? Well, that's all, darling. You've reached the bottom of the barrel. But I can't stop now. I've got this thing beat. Oh, can really? No, I mean it. Give me that money you've got. Oh, no. Not on your life. Oh, Irene, give it to me. I'll give you one dollar. No more. A dollar? But I can't play a dollar at this table. One dollar, Ken. Oh. Here. A dollar on 14 red. One dollar? Really, sir, the slot machines are in the corner. <laughs> oh, look, I know this isn't quite cricket, but I've been here for hours. Give me a break, will you? Mm, one dollar it is, then. <laughs> I'm going, Ken. Are you coming with me? In a minute, in a minute. Number 11, Red, the winner. Number 11. Well? Okay, okay. I can't understand it. Place your bets, please. Uh, cash me in, will you please? Sure thing. Here we are, a hundred and thirty-eight dollars. Hey, hey, how'd this old bill get in here? Run out of new ones? Yeah. Sorry, sir, but the dollar's a dollar. Yeah, no, but I like new ones. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> You're out kind of late, aren't you, Peppy? Yes, that's right. 
but I'm going home right now. The monkey's died. Hey, you don't mind getting an old building? No, thank you, sir. No, Pepe don't mind. Old dollars all the same as new ones. My landlord, he don't care how I pay him, just so long as I pay him. Oh, yeah, that's fine. It's yours, then. Good night. Uh, good night, sir, and thank you. Well, Ducci, we go home now. Very nice way to end the day, huh? One dollar for our music. He's a nice man. Oh, we better get to some eats before we go. Ah, Luigi. I'm glad you're still open. Sure, Pepe, I'm open. I got to stay open later to make a living these days. What'll it be? Well, give me the same thing, I guess. A salami and a... Oh, and a summer bananas for the monkey. Sure thing. How's it going today, eh? Good? Uh, not so bad. A very nice evening. A fella give us a dollar just before we start home. A dollar? Oh, ah. Hey, that's good. Here you are, Pepe. 68 cents. Hey, you don't mind an old dollar, do you? Oh, they're all the same with me. Here's your change. Hey, uh, you wait a minute, I walk with you. It's time to close up for the day, I think. I lock up the money and we go. You, you leave it at the money in that little drawer, Luigi? Sure. <laughs> Somebody could have steal it so easy. Oh, far out, bother with the little money Luigi has. Come, we go. And the fool of Luigi, I think you're crazy in the head to leave your money in that dinky little drawer. Uh, maybe you're right, I play it safe tonight. I take it home with me just to make sure. This is the first time I do this, too. <laughs> That's a bad. I leave just one dollar in the drawer for luck, eh? <laughs> That's good. I sleep better now. You ready? I'm ready. I go as far as 14th. We walk together. Okay. Boy, boy, I have a good time. This is money in this drawer. Hey, one lousy buck. Some haul. I'd hold it. I'd hold it. I'm on hold. Stop her on shoot. Okay. Okay, don't shoot. I give up. Well, son, I guess I don't have to ask you what you were up to. Come on, let's have it. Okay. All right, now the rest of it. That's it. It's all there was in the till. One dollar. Let's see about that. Yeah, it looks like you were right. Not a very profitable evening's work, eh? Look, mister, give me a break, will you? It's not like I took a thousand dollars or something. All I got was a dollar. Can't you just sort of forget the whole thing? I promise, this is the last time I'll ever pull anything like this again. Honest. I'm sorry, son. It doesn't make any difference how much you got. You know, the penalty for murder is the same whether you kill one person or 20. It's the same thing in your case. So come on. A dollar bill may have bought you some time in reform school. <laughs> Danny Dollar Bill. He wished he'd never been printed. He wanted so much to make people happy, and all he'd succeeded in doing for young Tommy was to buy him five years of misery. Then one day, he found himself in a large bank again. This was a common occurrence for Danny, but this time he noticed that he'd been put to one side with some other old dollar bills. And for some reason, Danny felt uneasy about the situation, and he tried to wriggle away, but the blank teller, he pasted a big glass paperweight smack on top of him and then he overheard the clerks talking. Helen, where are those old bills to be taken back and burned? Right here. I've got quite a little pile of them. You ready for them yet? Yeah, bring them over, will you? Right. I got them under this glass here so they... <gasps> the bank clerk suddenly stopped and stared at Danny for a long time. And then she <laughs> broke into a big grin and picked him up. <laughs> hey, Joe, look at this bill under the magnifying glass. What's the matter with it? Well, just look at it. Well, I'll be. <laughs> Say, we've got to show this to the boss. Well, Danny was completely mystified as the man took him into the office of the president of the bank. He looked at Danny closely and then... Well, I'll be doggone. <laughs> we'll have to do something about this. For the next few days, Danny was the center of attraction as he was placed on a rich red velvet cushion and then mounted in a fine glass case in the lobby of the bank. Over him was a sign. And then Danny knew why he was suddenly such an oddity. It all went back to that first day while he was being printed. One of the machines had tickled him, and Danny had wriggled. This had caused a slight maw in the engraving, and so on Danny Dollar Bill, George Washington was smiling. 
Thus, even though it was an error, Danny had one of the very few pictures ever to show Mr. Washington smiling. <laughs> and so Danny sits in his lovely little glass case in the bank lobby today, and he watches as people look at him and then break into a big grin themselves. Danny is important at last. Not only is he now worth a fabulous amount as a collector's item, but more important to him, Danny now has something that can make people smile. This is Susan Hayward again. Did you know that medical insurance is a Chinese invention? Well, it is. Many years ago, the head of a Chinese family made arrangements to pay his family doctor at the end of each year, but to pay him only for those days on which there'd been no sickness in his home. Just the reverse of how it should be done, you might say. But think for a moment. Doesn't it make sense? He paid his doctor to keep his wife and children well, not to make them well. You can be sure that doctor did everything in his power to see that there were very few days of sickness in that home. Soon, all of his neighbors heard about his wonderful plan and made the same arrangement with their own doctors. And then, after a time, it became a national custom. You know, this custom can be applied to other things with just as much success. With prayer, for instance. If you'll do as family theater advocates, pray together as a family, you'll be doing more to ensure your family's unity than you might think. Through prayer, you'll strengthen your family unit enough to withstand any domestic ill that might arise. For it's more than a slogan, it's a promise when we say, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you the story of Donny, Danny Dollar Bill, starring Sterling Holloway as the narrator. Susan Hayward was your hostess, and Marion Richmond played Danny Dollar. Others in our cast were Ted DeCorsia, Verna Felton, Whitfield Connor, Howard McNear, Martha Shaw, Jeffrey Silver, Jack Raymond, Billy Bauckham, and Baden Powell. The script was written by William Lutz with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman and was directed for Family Theater by Joseph F. Mansfield. This is Tony Lafrano expressing the wish of Family Theater that the blessings of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to join us next week at this time when Family Theater will present Pat O'Brien and William Lundigan in Meet Mr. Jones. Join us, won't you? This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>